chapter 7, we're going to start with verse 3 when we begin to read. But let me tell you, I always like to tell you what's going on in the Bible. I don't like to just jump in it all of a sudden. I want you to know where we are, what has happened, what has transpired already, and what is fixing to take place. The double portion anointed prophet Elisha. He asked for a double portion of what his predecessor, I mean his successor, or his, would that be his predecessor? The predecessor comes before his successor. Uh, Elijah had. And so he did. He was a double portion anointed prophet. And he's ministering at this time. He has just called upon the Lord to show his servant that there were more soldiers in God's angel army than that of the surrounding army of the Arameans or the Syrians. And we know that miracle. The servant saw the, the enemy gathering around and had them quartered and uh, surrounded. And Elisha was not in fear at all because he could see something that the servant couldn't see. And when we look with the eyes of God, we can see things sometimes that we can't normally see. We're always trying to look at something just the way it is. There could always be a deeper meaning behind it. Right. You never know what might be going on behind the scenes. And so, so Elisha says, God, open up my servant's eyes so he can see what you're showing me. And God does, and that servant sees a, a vast multitude just beyond as far as the eye can see of an angel army surrounding him. And he knew then that there was more for them than there was against them. Amen. And Elijah asked God then to, to blind the eyes of the, the enemy. And God does, and Elisha leads them to enter North Israel's capital, which is Samaria, where Elisha instructs Israel's king at that time to spare the lives of the Syrians and feed them and send them home instead. Don't kill them, feed them, and send them home. Show mercy on them. They do, and there's peace for a little while. But sometime later, the Syrians return. And they attack Samaria and they attack Israel and they plunder, thereby resulting in a, the fallout from that results in a famine because they lose everything that they did have and at the same time things quit growing. Alright? That's a famine when there's nothing to eat, there's nothing growing and everything you did have is gone. So a famine, and it entails horrifying circumstances. And you ought to go back and read this in the Bible. It's, it's a rough read. It's, it's rough to read what actually takes place and how desperate people get. And the king, uh, people are going crazy because there's not enough. And a lot of times when people are taken out of their comfort zone, they might go a little crazy. And there's some horrifying things going on from, from people so hungry that they're actually committing an abominable act of cannibalism. To feed. It's horrible. Donkey's heads are being sold at a high rate because there's nothing else to eat. And so it's just horrifying circumstances. And, and the, the king is looking for somebody to blame. And who's he going to blame? He's going to blame the spiritual leader of that time, Elisha, because he represents God and, and he's the leader and he's supposed to make everything all right. And so he lashes out at him and blames him. And so Israel's king blames and lashes out against the prophet. And Elisha, though, Despite being blamed, despite his life being threatened, Elisha declares from God that it'll all turn around in 24 hours. Amen. Everything's going to be all right in a matter of 24 hours. Now, I have just given you just a little bit of a hint of how bad things were. That people are selling donkey's heads. People are performing cannibalism. That's, that's horrible. That's horrifying. But if things had gotten that bad, and in 24 hours things are going to turn around that quickly, yes. I serve a God who can. Amen. I serve a God who can remedy that situation. I serve a God who can heal. I serve a God that, that can pour in His love, and things can come back together, and things can get all right in record time. And so he declares a word of prophecy that in 24 hours' time, everything's going to be all right. He even begins to, to state how the prices of their economy are going to come down. Because at that time, the economy was just out of whack. He even states and quotes prices in the economy as coming down. And when he does that, and he talks about God turning everything around in 24 hours, one of the king's servants publicly doubts and denounces it. He says, 
Basically, looking at the circumstances, things are so bad, there's no way. Now, if it gets better, it's going to take some time. Because we're in such bad shape, it's going to take a while for things to get better. And I believe that. I know that there's situations, if it didn't happen overnight, it's going to take a little longer for it to get better. A marriage doesn't get broken overnight, and so it may not always just get better just like that. A relationship doesn't to get broken. A friendship, a working relationship, doesn't always get messed up overnight, so it may take some time. But this person, this servant of the king, is looking at the circumstances and the situation, and he says things have gotten so dire, they've gotten so desperate, there's no way that things could get better within 24 hours of time. Even if God, he says this, read your Bible, he says, even if God opens up the windows of heaven and pours down his blessing, is everything all right, Bob? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. <laughs> Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. 
This day is a day of what? Shout it. Good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied, and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out, and they told it to the king's household inside. Amen. I'm going to stop there for right now. But I want to challenge you this morning. Amen. There's a lot of things that could be hindering your mind. We've had a great service already. We've seen God do some things already. Amen. Amen. And I feel like we've, we've been fed to an extent. But I'm not full yet. And I hope you're not. Amen. So I want you to give it everything you've got. And I want you to focus this as intently as you can on what the Lord is about to say to you. Amen. Not what I'm about to say, but what the Lord is about to say. Amen. Christian Fellowship Church. Are you ready for the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Come on, give him a shout. Father, we come this morning by so thankful for the Lord to be in your house. And God, we ask you, Jesus, to help us this morning. Help us to receive this gift of power that is found in your word, God. May every person right now, the enemy may be trying to keep people from hearing this gift this morning. You may be trying to, to, to sidetrack them or, or, or throw some fiery darts in and blindside them in some way. But God, I come right now, right now, asking you, Jesus, to help them to focus. Help them to lock their eyes on you. Help them to lock their ears on what it is you want to say, God. Teach us today, O oh Lord, for only you can, God. We praise you, we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Somebody shout amen three times. Amen. 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 Praise one more time. You know why? Because it's worth it. Today's message is called The Good News That Cannot Wait. Say it with me. The Good News That Cannot Wait. Sometimes if we receive certain information, we may need to totally keep it in confidence and not share, or the news can be that that we hold on to for a time when we are able to sit down and explain it carefully, especially if it was delicate information concerning the health or loss of someone special. I remember when my, my dad, when his older brother passed away, and we left the hospital and he knew he had to go and tell his parents what had happened. And that wasn't anything that he could call them on the phone and tell them. That wasn't anything that he could walk right in the door and just tell them in passing. That was something that he had to carefully, methodically think about how he was going to say a, a piece of information like that because they were already elderly people at that time and they were about to find out they had lost their oldest child. So you, you, you have to wait on things like that and you have to carry it out in a certain way and how you do it. Amen? And I remember when Brother David preaching our beloved David Preacher uh, fell and, and injured himself at a fundraiser we were having. And, and everything just got turned upside down and he had to go to the hospital. And his wife was on the ambulance. And I remember Jeff Braxton jumping in the ambulance and driving across the 18th pole. <laughs> like something out of the 18th, Jeff. It was like, you were like, D.A. Barax. <laughs> Very adventurous and action-packed. But I remember then, I got with the task of having to tell David's mom. And uh, I didn't know how she would handle it. So when I called her on the phone, I told her, I said, I need you to say. And when, if, you t if you know David's mother, bless her heart, uh, she wants you to, no, 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 you tell me right now. What are you about to tell me? I said, I need you to sit down. You promise me you're sitting down? Yes. And because uh, I was really afraid that she might fall out and faint or something. And uh, I told her, and uh, it, I had to be careful about uh, how I did it, but thank God Brother David's fine now and everything's all right. But I just took the call up and just dropped that bomb on her. You know what I'm saying? That was, that was news. That was bad news. And it had to wait a little bit because I had to kind of pray about how I was going to uh, you know, say that. But when it comes to something positive and exciting, news that's positive, exciting, we may want to say it though still for a surprise, such as news of a promotion or, or a new opportunity or a surprise party or, or, or a special uh, 
the things, a gift that you may have for someone. If you've gotten your, your spouse something for your anniversary, you don't want to go and say, hey, I did this today. If the anniversary is another month out, you want to hold on to that. So there's good news and bad news that you have to, to wait on. But how many knows when it comes to a, a breakthrough? Come on. When it comes to a mountain moving experience? Come on. When it comes to a life impacting testimony? When it comes to a long awaited or a short awaited time of, of an answer to prayer, amen, that is truly good news that cannot wait. We can't sit on news like that, amen. I'm glad when it's, you know, you know, Louise was trying to kind of surprise me the other night with his testimony and she hadn't said anything, but Brother Sonny couldn't, he couldn't keep it to himself. He said, Preacher, I got to tell you something, Kitty don't have cancer no more. Amen. They, they did the test. It's, it's, he said, now, Louise is probably going to tell you. <laughs> but I don't really tell Because it was good news that could not wait. <laughs> Amen? And whenever there's a chance to praise God, Sister Laura, that's a chance we've got to take. <laughs> to give Him glory. To tell somebody what the Lord has done in your life. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. And when you really sit back, and you've been walking with God for a while, and you start to sit back and think about the good things that God has done in your life and everything that He's brought you through. That's something that somebody else needs to hear about. Can somebody give him a shout of praise if he's ever done anything good in your life? Hallelujah. Such was the case in our text today. And we start out in verse 3. We've come to the part where Elisha has declared. Despite how bad things are, it's going to turn around in 24 hours. Not 48 hours. Not 72 hours. That is three days, isn't it? Yeah. We won't even get to how many hours is in four days, okay? We're not here to have math class today, people. We're here to learn life. Got a little quizzy on my math. I made it out by the hair of my chin, chin, chin. Amen. They didn't. He barely passed. Just make him leave. Make him leave. Make him leave. This part. But he has declared that things are going to get better in just 24 hours. Now, it says that there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. Four leprous men. Four men who were sick. Four men who were weak. Four men who other people didn't want to be around. The reason they were at the entrance of the gate is because they were outcasts. They were rejects. In that day and time, there was nothing they could do for people who suffered from such a thing. And so they would have to, they, when they came into town, because they would need provision, they would need supplies. But when they came into town, the law said they had to walk through town and say, unclean. Meaning, don't get near me, you might get what I have. And they had to humiliate themselves every time they went into town. They had to admit they were sick. They had to admit, admit they were contagious. They had to admit. And, and so people didn't want to have anything to do with them. They were the rejects. They were the outcasts of the town. So that's why they were there on the outskirts. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? There's nothing out here and there's nothing in there. If we say we will enter the city, there's famine in the city and, if, and we shall die there. And if we see here, we die also. So they have come to what we call a conundrum. They have come to a, uh, a, a place where they just don't see a whole lot of hope in either choice that they have. But sometimes you come down to a place in your life where you might not see a whole lot of hope in what you have. But that's when God may have to set you up and take a risk. Come on, come on. Amen? What kind of risk? Well, look at this. It says, now therefore... Come, they say, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. That's the people who had plundered the city and took everything that they had in the city. And then a famine is happening on top of that. Imagine a famine where there's no supplies saved up because everything's been stolen and plundered. This is the end. They say, now therefore, because see, the Syrians in this time, when they were going around plundering and stealing, they were trying to occupy and overtake land. And so they weren't going back to their palace. They weren't going back to occupy their place. They were going out and camping out, going to attack more people so they could steal, steal, steal. Who does that sound like? Sounds like the enemy. They say, camping out, trying to steal more and more. Now, therefore, they said, come and let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. The enemy. If they keep us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, 
we shall only die. I mean, we're going to die anyway. But there's a chance if we surrender to the enemy, they'll arrest us, make us prisoners, and they'll feed us. And then we'll live. But if we surrender to them and they cut our throats and kill us, well, we're dying out here anyway. And so they didn't see it as though they had a whole lot to lose. But what the only outlet of provision and breakthrough that they saw was taking a huge risk, going into the enemy's camp and surrendering. And so they do that. They're headed that way. It says, and they rose the four lepers, these four sick men, these four outcasts, these four people who would be rejected by the people of God, the people of Israel, the people of Samaria. It says they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. All right? Now again, this is the enemy's camp. They are going down to the enemy's camp. All right? They're going down to the very place of the people who have the people of Israel's stuff. They got their gold. They got their silver. They got their horses. They got their supplies. All right? It says, and so they go down there. They're prepared to surrender. They're to prepared to have their throats cut and die and be put out of their misery. But they're also prepared to maybe have some mercy shown their way and be fed and kept alive. But what happens? It says, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. So you get yourself ready to go take an option of breakthrough that contains a whole lot of risk and you think you know what's going to happen. You think you're going to get there and you're, and you're going to surrender. You know you're going to surrender. But when you get there, you're either going to be shown some mercy and kept alive for a little while or you're going to be killed. But they get there and there's nobody there. How many know that many times we think we know how God's going to work our situation out and we think we know what God has to do in order to do it. And we're just sitting back saying, God, I'm waiting on you to do this and do that. I'm waiting on you to orchestrate this and have that. And then all of a sudden, our breakthrough comes through a form in a way that we haven't even been looking for. Amen. When we get to the breakthrough, it doesn't look like we thought it would look like in our finite minds. But that's why we got to look at things the way He sees it. we got to handle things the way He would handle it. Amen? Amen? And so they go there thinking that they're going to surrender. Thinking that they may have mercy shown upon them and they'll live a little longer or they'll go ahead and be killed anyway. But they get there and nobody's there. Why is the camp empty? Why is the camp empty? Look at this. Verse 6. Say those three words with me. For the Lord. For the Lord. I love it when a sentence starts with those three words. For the Lord. Not for a man. For a person. Come on. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. God did something they couldn't do. Amen. They didn't even know that God was going to use them for their own breakthrough. They go down into the enemy's camp. There's nobody there. And they get there, and the reason there's nobody there is because the enemy has tucked down and run. Because God has caused the enemy to hear something much greater than what it really was. You see, a lot of times we don't have any faith in ourselves, and we'll say, I can never do this. They thought they had to go down there and surrender and, and risk their lives, and probably they were going to get killed. And they were going to have to surrender to the enemy. They had made up their minds that was what they were going to have to do. But God took four men who were sick in their flesh. He took four men who were weak. He took four men who, who were dirty. He took four men who nobody wanted around, and he calls them to sound like a mighty
God is still using. God is still using. And not only did He make them sound like an army, they sounded so big and so massive that the enemy said Israel must have gone and got some help. Israel went and hired the Hittites. Israel went and hired the, the nation of Egypt. And they all banded together. They made, he made four leprous men sound like three armies from three different nations. I serve a God who can. I serve a God that has not the steps of my feet. And when a man or a woman of God walks into a situation that might look real, he can make that man, he can make that woman sound like an army to all over the world. Somebody say, God, make you sound like an army. Amen. They get there, verse 7, it says, Therefore, they, the Syrians, arose and fled at twilight and left the camp. What? Intact. They were so scared. They didn't even grab anything. They didn't grab a coat. They didn't grab their clothes. They didn't grab the piles of food they had. They didn't grab any of the treasures they had stolen. They got out of Dodge. They got out of there. And look, they left everything there. Everything they had stolen. They left there. Their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, ready to die or ready to be taken prisoner, they went into one tent and they ended up eating and drinking, carried from it silver and gold and clothing, and they went and they hid this stuff. Because these guys were poor, they didn't have anything. They went and they hid this stuff and hid it up. <clears throat> and they did all this. They had hit jackpot. They had hit the treasure. And they went in there and they did all that. And they went and hit it. But then something got a hold of their conscience. Something got a hold of their minds and they couldn't shake it. You ever had something get a hold of you and bother you and you just can't shake it? You can't shake it. They couldn't get away. Here they were hungry. Here they were sick. Here they were, had all these things going on. And now, now, they're living in the lap of luxury. They have stumbled upon a modern day paradise. And it says that one said to the other, this is all great, but we're not doing the right thing. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we remain silent. We need to tell our people about this. Our people who have casted us out. Our people who won't even let us live in the city limits. Our people who don't want to have anything to do with us. But they're still our people. Because we've been raised that if somebody has leprosy, we're supposed to stay away from them. So if we were in their shoes, perhaps, and I'm paraphrasing here, maybe the lepers thought, if we were in their shoes, we wouldn't want to be around us either. But at the end of the day, when somebody gets a breakthrough, it doesn't matter if that person who's hurting and needs a breakthrough too did something to you. God says, love them anyway. God says, go help them out anyway. Well, they offended me, God. They hurt me. They wronged me. Lord God, they, 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 they said this, they said that. God says, go love them anyway. You walk into the breakthrough, and now I'm going to use you, the rejected one. I'm going to use you, the outcast. I'm going to use you, the one that nobody else wants to be around. I'm going to use you to bring the breakthrough to the whole place. Amen? Amen. Amen. And they said, we're not, we're not doing right, sitting on top of this information, on top of this treasure, and we're just being silent, keeping this all to ourselves. Our people are dying up there. And if we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now that's when you've got some discernment and you've got the spirit of conviction on you to realize I'm not going to go there with God. Because I might die. I might go through something tragic. I, you know, I, I kind of opened my heart up a little bit Wednesday night and I shared with the Wednesday night class that there was a time, not hardly a year, after I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I started preaching immediately. I don't know how that happened. It was a God thing. But I came under attack. 
was dealing with some things, and I came that close to giving up and going back to the old life. The craving for alcohol was so powerful. It came back on me one night. And the craving for drugs and the craving to just satisfy the lust of the flesh came back. And I came so close to going back. But then I saw a picture of myself. And I felt a feeling inside of me. And the conviction was so hard that I felt if I was to go back, if I was to go back, that I would die. The conviction and the punishment of God that would come upon me was so hard that I felt as though I would die. And you know, it's important as a Christian for us, for us to feel that way. Amen? We must be able to ask ourselves and hold our own selves accountable and say, if this was to happen to me, if I was to go back, if I was to sit on this information, you know, it's wrong to lie, but it's also wrong to know the truth and not tell it. That's right. Amen. It's, it's, it's wrong to take the breakthrough and take the answer to prayer and hoard it and, and hold on to it and not let nobody else have access to it. Amen. <clears throat> and so he says, if we wait till morning light, it might be too late, some people might die. Some punishment will come upon us. These men, now society says, society would say, they wronged you, they casted you out, they wrote you off, they don't even care. They're having a famine right now, they don't care less if the lepers who are living on the outskirts of town live through this thing. And people would say, you need to get even, because that's our flesh, I need to get even. They did this to me, I'm going to do it back to them. They should have been nicer to me. They should have helped me. They should have been there. They should have said that about me. Now I got to break through. God's blessing me. God's not going to bless me. God's going to punish them. No. That's not how the God I serve works. Because Jesus said, love thy enemy. You see, when Jesus Christ taught people how to treat each other, He covered everything. He covered all the things that could make us get offended. He covered all the things that could tear families apart. He, he covered all the things that could tear ministries and churches apart. The thing that we fail to do is that we don't act like Jesus. Yes, and we don't handle things the way Jesus said handle. We don't handle things the way the Word of God, the way the Word of, God, of the Lord says to handle them. Amen. That's where we mess up. And that's this life. That's this Christian life. Getting our lives more and more in line so that when problems come up, we handle it like Jesus. We make mistakes and don't do it. I make mistakes and don't do it. We fall short. But if we we'll learn from that mistake and get more and more in line with it, the Word, and handle it the way He said handle it, we'll find ourselves having a lot more peace. Amen? Now therefore come, let us go, they said, and tell the king's household. And they did. They went called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied, and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and told it to the king's household inside. Guess what? If you kept reading, the king has everything set up for them to go to the enemy's camp, take back what they stole from him, and... Let people take turns. Going in, he's got gatekeepers, guards all around him. One of the guards is the servant who said, even if God was to open the windows of heaven and rain down everything heaven has to offer, it still would turn things around in 24 hours. Now, the servants, I mean, the uh, lepers, didn't wait till nightfall, remember? They said, we can't wait. we got to go right now. This thing started to turn around in less than 24 hours. But the people were so desperate so hungry that when the provision was there they started to run towards it. It was like a riot. Alright? You, 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 know, you can imagine people today there was a famine in this land and God would have set up camp down here and had stacks and stacks of pizza. My gosh, what would happen? People would get trampled. That's what happened. A man got trampled and killed. You know who it was? The one who doubted and said, even if God even if God, read your Bible, it'll tell you it's the same one who said, even if God rains down the window, from the windows of heaven and pours out everything heaven has to offer, this won't turn around. Look, when you die, you're going to miss out. 
When you die, you're going to get left out. And so we can't doubt what God can do. If we can doubt what a man can do. We can doubt what the pastor can do. We can, have, we can lose faith in a lot of people. But you can't doubt what God can do. Because God can turn any situation around. In any time. So God grants the breakthrough during a famine by using four lepers who stumbled upon something that was too good to keep to themselves. Amen? It's important, church, to share the good news of Jesus Christ that is the gospel. Amen? Not everybody will walk through those doors, but everybody in here is going to walk out those doors today. And we've got to go out there and we've got to tell people the good news that we have heard. Amen. And we've got to tell them to come on and hear some more. We may come to church, you mean, where everybody's snooty and you've got to sit here and you can't sit there and I can sit here and I can sit there. You know? You've got to go buy a three-piece outfit just to be able to fit in and all this and that. Hey, man, I wear my three-piece outfit when I feel led, but sometimes I don't. Amen. Because I want to be able to relate to everybody. I want to be able to relate to the people who can afford it and those who can't. I want to be able to relate to the sick and the hungry. I want to be able to relate to the addicted because I was addicted. You're not looking at somebody who's been saved his whole life. You're looking at somebody who has struggled. Somebody who has hurt. Somebody who's been in pain. Somebody who has failed and made mistakes even after I got saved. Christian. 
Christians, we can't keep all this to ourselves anymore. And many times we do. Many times we do. The hardest people in your life to witness to about Jesus is your family. Many times it's easier to go up to a stranger on the street and tell them that Jesus loves them than to be able to tell a close family member. That's your flesh. But you got to let that spirit man rise up out of that flesh and overcome that flesh and tell that person in your family that's not truly living for the Lord. You've got to show them that better way. You can tell them too, and you can keep telling them, but there comes a time too when you have to back up and show them. We can tell the good news, but there's more ways to share the good news than just telling them. We've got to live it. We've got to live it. How do I live it? Well, do they see you turn away from sin? Do they see you getting in the gossiping conversation? Do they see you join in all the backbite? Do they see you stirred up in a bunch of drama? Do they see you coming to God's house on a regular basis? Do they ever see you pray? Do they ever hear you mention his name? Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a time when I was. There was a time when I was. That any kind of outward show and expression of love to him, I was ashamed of it. I thought it made me less of a man. But when it comes to my wife and my children and my mama and my daddy, I will show love. I will hug somebody's neck. I will tell them that they love them, that I love them. So how, and, and, and you know, they've done a lot for me. But how can I not show him that? After all he's done for me, how can I not openly, publicly tell him I love him? Talk to him, set aside time for him. He means so much. And we've got to get on fire for him. It's time to get passionate about him again, church. Don't lose your fire. Don't lose your passion. And go after him. Because you don't know who's watching. That night when I almost turned back, I started thinking about some things. I said, my wife is so happy that I'm living this way now. I'm bringing my son to church. I've got my family back after all these years. My mother and father are relieved that they don't have to sit up all night and wait for a call. Brother Jerry is counting on me. The Christians that I've, or that I'm networking with, they're counting on me. And other people who have found out about the life that I quit are looking at me and looking for more and more reasons for them to walk away from it. What if I fall in front of all these people? That's right. I can't. I can't. I got to keep going. And guess what? You can't either. Because we have heard and we have received the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you've got it, you can't keep waiting to tell somebody else about it. You can't keep waiting to sell out and truly live it in front of people. I got it. I'm coming to church. Are you living it? Are you truly living it? Are you searching and seeking out sanctification? Holiness. Separation from the world that says this is the difference in me now as a Christian than from who I used to be. Amen. Amen. And that's hard. And people don't want to hear it because they won't sell a bunch of books and pack auditoriums and all the different conferences. Amen. But it's the truth. we got to share the good news and then we got to dig deeper. And when you start digging deeper, you'll find sanctification. You'll find righteousness. You'll find holiness. Amen. Man. It's the good news, church, that cannot wait any longer. We can't afford to wait any longer. Yeah. Stand to your feet. I didn't mean to go so long.